Uh, I promise not to take very long uh, so that we've got plenty of time for questions. And it's, uh, it's a real honour uh, to speak after Pete and, and John. Uh, and in a way makes my job much easier because there are things that I, I, I don't have to say and a huge amount I didn't know. Uh, my name's Danny Doring. I'm from Oxford. I did join the Labour Party 40 years ago. So you look remarkably young uh, as a school child. Um, my first research job was in housing for the Roundtree Foundation when I worked up in Newcastle. Um, I've done work on and off on housing ever since and still do. <coughs> the kind of reality uh, of housing policy or, or where it's decided well, my impression of where it's decided isn't necessarily by groups like this. Very occasionally I've been invited to party conferences where there's a dinner with the housing minister or the shadow housing minister. Now, I can't honestly remember which the last one was, but there's always a long table. There's the minister in the middle, there's the person from Savills, there's all the builders, and then I'm on the end. And I've been to the Tory and the Labour conferences and I can't remember which it was. That's how it, how it works. Um, I think we have to do a tiny bit about just how good the history is and a bit about other places before talking about what Labour at least should aspire to. Now, Pete is completely right about the money having run out. That implication, you cannot print it you print it, we won't be able to import food. We have to borrow at 5.5% over 30 years. Um, we are facing the money having run out. You can certainly redistribute. You can tax the wealthy, all kinds of things you can do. But even that will just give you enough to get by, which is why you're going to have to do that. But you can lie and claim you're not going to if you want. My life's easy. I'm an academic. I can say it how I think. Um, Summer 2022, I was at the European Social Housing Conference. It happens every two years. I think it's in Dublin this year. It's a brilliant conference. Thousands of people across Europe, absolutely inspired by social housing. They talk about what they're doing in the Netherlands. They talk about what they're doing in Spain. And then this one was in Helsinki, and you can guess because you're interested in housing. And they were proud. What was interesting was actually watching people from Finland talk confidently on stage about what had been achieved. It's quite a modest nation before, and the, you know, the practical elimination of homelessness. 90% of student flats being provided by the state with a decent cooker, kitchen, double bed for a student on their own, <laughs> paying, paying a very small amount of rent. But those 90% <laughs> of student flats being available first to overseas students before anybody else, because they don't have family in Finland, so of course you'd do that, wouldn't you? I mean, it... I had to pitch myself during this week at various points. Oh, they've all got a sauna. Right? And, of course, you immediately think, this is new, you immediately think, oh, that'll just be used for storage. Right? Of course, you know, you build somebody a store, you know, it'll be full. Well, we've got to go round. Nobody put crap in their sauna. Anyway. Um, now, it's depressing, but, the, but the, the thing which is uplifting is you don't have to just look back to the past you can look across Europe and know that things are possible. Right now, in countries that are not that rich, Finland is not that rich, uh, you can look at how Germany managed to house so many Syrians and have a lower number of people in tents than we did without letting anybody uh, in. Uh, or you can talk to the person responsible for the building of student housing in Norway, which of course is council housing, because why wouldn't you? I mean, what idiot would let companies based in Guernsey build the bulk of their student housing so that the middle class can send £7,000 a year for their little darlings to be in the most expensive sh crap? Uh, lonely flat with the most expensive toilet they'll ever have in their life. That's us, student housing. Norway. They build the student housing there. In Norway, unlike in Finland, the students don't want to have an apartment on their own. They want to be in houses of 12 or 16. Summer 2022, the person in charge of the building of the new student housing in Oslo told me he was competing with builders 
in Kensington for iron girders and he could beat them on price. Right? And that's because the Suez Canal was in trouble and the, there were problems getting building material. 1945, in case you don't believe the rhetoric, there's another way of looking at it, which is the 1946 birth cohort. Birth cohorts are one of the things we're very good at in Britain. These are all the children born in a particular week. You've got them, you've got the birth certificates, you follow them through life to see what happens to them. 1946 birth cohort, absolutely random, of them, they're all born in the same week, the whole lot of them. Uh, majority spent part of their child in the council house. That's how effective the 45 government and governments before it were, but 45. The majority of children born in Britain in 46 lived at some point in a council house. So whenever somebody older than you tells you, I grew up in a council house, you can say, oh, you're normal. You weren't in the minority then. <laughs> um, we can also, of course, because they're in the birth cohort, check the effects on health and see how much better it was than if you were stuck still in the private renting then. A uh, study came out just two weeks ago showing the effects of private renting on reducing your life expectancy. <coughs> and the effects of, of social council housing, no detriment. No detriment. Right? Security means no advantage. It doesn't actually make you live longer than people with a mortgage like me. <coughs> right? The kind of happy warmth of socialism doesn't kind of add extra... But there's no detriment. This is the, there's no reduction in life expectancy. There's no difference for somebody like me. I've got a mortgage. And somebody in a council flat, we have the same life expectancy, give or take away, social class, job, the fact I eat and drink too much, and so on. Right? Um, the rest of the world copied what we did in social housing. Right? We were really the pioneers. You can, you can look at Vienna and a few other places, but we really were uh, the pioneers. You've mentioned the competing in the 50s and they weren't, you know, they weren't much worse. The Tories built more because when you really win is when you alter the hearts and minds of the opposition party. When you capture the opposition party and get the opposition party to believe and do what you do, then you've won. And that's what Labour had actually done in '45. They captured the Tories. And so the Tories were not really Tories in the 1950s. They can't have been, otherwise we couldn't have become the second most equal country to Sweden in Europe. Labour get it again in 1964. You have most of your, I've got to get it wrong, a huge amount of council house building in the 70s in London, which makes life livable. Uh, and then we get it wrong, we fall apart at the end of the 70s we get the right to buy without the right to sell, we get rid of decent tenancies um, 1990s negative equity, a bit of a wobble about how good is the private market uh, but then a the question, and this, this matters over what should Labour do you have to ask yourself what has Labour done what did Labour do between 1997 and 2010 now, yes, double glazing. Yes, new kitchens. Embarrassed about it, so didn't tell the public they were doing that, but did it. But what did Labour do about rent regulation? What was Labour actually do the last time it was in office? I had a phone call in 2009 from somebody working in the party saying, have you noticed we've moved half the money from regional development to the mortgage rescue package for the south-east of England? And I said, no, I haven't. Said, Why did you do that? I said, because we can't let house prices fall. <coughs> now, OK, 2008 was a big crash. You might have been frightened, but this underlying philosophy of house prices have to be kept up and have to be as high as ever, well, Labour didn't just, my party, didn't just believe in it, they actually shifted a load of money in 2009 <laughs> to make sure uh, it happened. By 2010, a quarter of all our children in England were in private rented accommodation. Moving home every three years on average. Moving friends, changing schools. Parents petrified. A quarter. What was being done to change that? So be very careful. Brilliant record from 1945 and the 1960s. Terrible record from, from 2010. Sorry, 1997 to 2010. But 
just to annoy everybody here, it wasn't brilliant in 2016 either. Uh, it was well-meaning, but John Healy, who, who really loves at least John Healy stayed in the job, you know. Uh, but John Healy announced the policy, I think it was 2016, of compulsory purchase at agricultural prices on the edge of towns where there was need, citing the example of Stevenage. But people knew what he actually meant. It wasn't just Stevenage. Um, and you've got to be careful. Or, and I'll only be five minutes, I promise, for this. Um, or be aware that your words can be really powerful. Now, in this case, I live in Oxford again. I grew up in Oxford. We've had colleges that have owned land on the edge of Oxford for centuries. We had a whole load more colleges that bought land on the edge of Oxford in 1927 to try to stop the 1927 development plan to turn it into a cycling, green, lovely city um, because they didn't want that. So right round the city I live in, the land is owned largely by colleges of my university. There's a golf course within a mile of the centre of Oxford on a hill. Um, The most common way to die if you grow up in Oxford below the age of 65, is to die homeless for local Oxford children. That's still, still the case. What happens when John announces in 2016 that it'll be Labour Party policy to buy at agricultural prices, land on the edge of cities, even then with what looked at less than a 5% chance of a Labour government, do you remember? That was before we realised the biggest, fastest rise per annum in the vote for Labour, bigger than 45 by far, occurred in 2017. Unbelievable swing. The 1945 swing was from 35 to 45, so 10 years. The 2015 to 2017 swing is off the scale. Um, But even before the 2017 election happened, colleges started selling the land because a shadow minister had said that it was Labour policy to purchase at agricultural price. This is their asset. They're charities. I'm a trustee of one of them. It is my duty as a trustee to maximise the benefits for the charity. Uh, the purposes of the charity are religion and education. It's a, and we must make as much money from our investments as possible. So we must invite Grosner, whoever, or Devonshire, somebody, and I've forgotten the swarmy, dark-haired man who came to my suburb and showed us the double garage houses he was going to build on the edge of the city for people to commute to London. And when I said my children will never be able to afford to look there, he looked at me with pity. Now I know I'm scruffy, right? I don't think he quite realised I was a professor from the University of Oxford saying my children will never be able to live in this city if you build those huge houses with their enormous drives and their space for all the cars. They're built. They're built. Some of them, shouldn't say because we're recording, some of them were built by, by um, some young apprentices I know who are only 18 and learning how to wire a house up for the first time. Anyway, they're yours, <laughs> they're, they're yours for 2.5 million. <coughs> Isn't our building industry wonderful? Um, so, you know, that's... Uh, now... Preferably, and I know it's a little Oxford example, I'd have much preferred we never built them, so the land is there, so you could create your Freiburg in the future if you wanted. But you can sort this thing out. What should Labour do? Labour needs not to simply present a picture of itself as a slightly less unkind version of the Conservative Party. It really does need to stop doing that. Um, That is how it is seen. By young people paying the highest rents we've ever charged, you'll know that rents have gone up more than they've ever, ever gone up before. Right? The offering of maybe some rent control when you didn't do it, we didn't do it, from 1997 to 2010 doesn't work. It's got to be more, more robust. You've got to say that the rent levels will go down. They will go down. And by saying things, you have an effect. Just as those colleges sold the land after 2016 because they thought that they would fail in the legal case to demand their right to property, by saying that rents will go down, you'll have an effect. Now, nobody's going to bulldoze their private rented housing. Well, there'll be one idiot that does, but nobody else. They'll sell it. They'll sell it to families trying to get a home. 
you need to have somebody again with a nail and a hammer and a requisition order. The first thing that the coalition government did in 2010, I think they almost their very first act of parliament, was to rescind the act that Labour had put in to allow compulsory purchase if a property was not occupied for six months and change it to two years. Right? So it did get them. We have more housing in this city per person in terms of rooms than we've ever had. This is London. The housing's there. I do local talks where I get people to type in the census code online. You can draw yourself a nice interactive map of your tiny neighbourhood in any community centre and look at how many people have got two spare bedrooms. It's about 30% in the most crowded areas of Oxford. And of course you need them for the kids at Christmas or whatever, but we've never had so many spare bedrooms. That has to be reduced, right? There's all kinds of incentives and ways you can do it, but it has to be reduced by making it in people's interests when they're living on their own in a free bed semi to move to an apartment without stairs nearby with their friends. So the Green Party needs to know that we can build council houses. Once the Green Party knows we can build council houses rather than send people to Newcastle, which is their policy in Oxford, they become really powerful. So you need to worry for your Labour, because the minute the Green Party say that they're willing to build houses, what isn't there to like if you're under 45 in that party? Right? Labour's really, really weak on this. Um, and lastly, we ought to honestly say that the desire is for the median price of housing for still the majority of the population that buy or own, the median price of that housing should come down half a percent, one percent, year after year after year until it hits the medium European levels. Just saying it has an effect on speculation. Just saying it makes people think, do I jump in now when it's my only chance uh, to buy? You don't have to do any of this. You can ignore me. I could be wrong. It's going to get sorted out some way. It always does. You can't have one of the worst records on homelessness, as worse as far as we can see. The greatest increase in child poverty were measured. Children's heights going, black mould, the roofs falling down. You can't actually be this truly abysmally awful and not relatively improve. It would be actually really, really hard. Uh, the question isn't really that we've got to do something different. The question, to my mind, is how willing are we to say that and can we do it in 15 or 20 years rather than in 40 or 50 years? And, and, and that's the choice. Copying conservative policy, ideology, stories about what's possible, and simply saying we'll just be a bit nicer and more caring, which is how it is perceived outside, is not attractive. Liberals can do really well if you're doing that. And of course they come second in so many seats. Greens start to pick up seats in areas with many young people, in areas which are very diverse, and in areas with incredibly high housing costs where they don't see a promise uh, in the party that's so far ahead in the polls because, of course, nobody says they're going to vote for that lot. I, I worry about it. I think it's, there's a complacency at the moment... And we're running out of time. The dashboards at the Department for Leveling Up and Housing are all showing terrible, terrible rises in demand and need, from refugees not being housed to street homelessness rising <coughs> to children's situations getting dramatically worse to people not being able to pay the mortgage because they're still getting the new fixed-term deals on a higher uh, rate than they are um, it's, it's very, very, very serious. We've got tired of using the word crisis. Um, but you've got to evoke something different and better. And to do it, you use the past, where we did it so well, and you use other European countries that show it's possible now. And you don't say you're going to do it out of your existing resources because there aren't any. You are going to have to redistribute to be able to do 
a lot of this, which includes redistributing people's unneeded second flats, second homes, right? We can't afford to have them anymore. I'll end on Norman Tebbit. Norman Tebbit wrote a few years ago, he was in the House of Lords, his chauffeur was driving him past out, out of the House of Lords' home, and Lord Tebbit wrote that he thought it was awful that he had to drive so far, or his chauffeur had to drive him so far, past all these flats with windows with no lights in them. And he said, how did that happen? And I, I was thinking, were you really a minister for all those years and didn't realise <laughs> the repercussions of the market is most efficient? Right? The market is the least efficient way to allocate land and space. You end up wasting an enormous amount of it. Thank you very much. through history and looking at what has worked in the past has been very informative and instructive. I suppose what would be helpful to hear is what are the solutions to the myriad issues that you have presented, um, but what is the positive thing that we can do rather than what are the things that the Labour Party should not do. Um, but I'll come to Ross to take your question. Yeah, thanks, <clears throat> Of course, this is an unmet housing and retail cabinet member and partner. I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I, I don't personally see how, without housing grants coming back, we're actually going to shift a lot of these problems. And that's where I don't think I think we do need to challenge. I, I recognise the, the political positioning ahead post COVID and everything else, but I, I think the Labour government doesn't do uh, extra uh, extra grant funding, I think we, we won't go anywhere near solving the problem. So, <coughs> so uh, when my, our, our housing revenue account in Barnet is in a better position than almost any other in London, it will go to deficit within a couple of years. I, most of them already are, are, are going to deficit. I, but slightly cheekily, I will ask the question when have you ever, I, when have you ever heard of a Lib Dem or Green politician actually sporting? housing rather than being an indie because I I have to say my experience is that actually it is very difficult to get those the greens to they, they might nationally say things and they know to do uh, but actually when it comes to planning applications locally uh, they're usually at the top of the front of the queue of the the, the Lindy kind of uh, yeah. so uh, it's a question when have you got any examples of them supporting <laughs> large scale social housing Okay, and then third question for this round, if you want to... Yes, go ahead. Okay, my name's Sean Fitzsimons. Um, I did a study on housing in Croydon, the private rental sector. Because Croydon, uh, for, for a five-year period, had a licensing scheme, which meant we knew where the 40,000, who the landlords were, or the 40,000 properties that were in the private rental sector. And in the 1990s, Croydon probably only had about 15,000 properties in the private rental sector. So 25 years, growing massively. And when we looked at the figures, or well, I looked at the figures, of that 22,000 landlords, uh, there was about 14 or 15 that we could identify, and 11,000 of them lived in the borough of Croydon. So most of the private landlords who owned one or two properties owned properties within their communities. And a lot of them had lived in those properties originally or inherited them, and then moved to a bigger house but never sold up the previous one and rented it out. So when people talk about spare rooms, it's not just, I think you just mentioned that. So we have this vast capacity, we have across London, and across, I think, the southeast of England, there are, are lots of people in their 60s, it's the baby boom generation, who <coughs> kept hold of those properties that they originally lived in or inherited. So the financial incentive for the Labour government is you don't have to spend a lot of money, you wouldn't buy them off them, but you want to incentivise them to sell up <coughs> um, because you then create uh, home ownership opportunities or social rented people to buy those properties. But do you think at the moment that we are willing to tackle that generation of people who were born in 1946, who own these homes, uh, because they are the biggest voting bloc in the country? 
Okay. So you don't have to answer all of those, but we'll start with. Start with me. Danny? Yeah. Um. Uh. Yes, yeah, but you're certainly right in my experience as Liberals and Greens. Uh, in Oxford, the street doesn't go green till the house price is over a million. And, that, and that's when, if you want to map out the green wards. But the four mosques are willing to tell everybody to vote green in Oxford. All the Green Party have to do, and they may not believe it, is start talking seriously about housing. And the one thing which differentiates Labour from the other parties. Now, and the Liberals, if you look at the voting map of the country, it's all the areas between the cities where they're the second party. Okay? Uh, and they're there. Um, positive. You need to actually pledge that you will ensure that a certain number of people will be well housed every year in the first five years. And you will do it partly by ensuring that people do not have second or third empty homes. You'll, the tax you'll put on people for that privilege will be so high that they will be forced to hand over property. Um, if it's been empty and it's derelict, you'll requisition it. You're going to tax the very wealthy. Uh, the person earlier very close to me currently fixes the lights in swimming pools in Oxfordshire of multi-millionaires because they want them to work underwater. That person is just as capable of fixing the wiring in dodgy houses in poorer parts of the city. The question is, how do you move that person, an apprentice electrician, from working for the very rich to fixing things for the poor? And the mechanism is very simple. You tax the very rich so they can't afford the electrician to fix the swimming pool. Uh, to do it, and it's as positive as that. It, but you don't say, don't worry, we'll unleash productivity and there'll be another 300,000 houses built a year. When I first worked for the Roundtree Foundation as a researcher in 1993, <coughs> the target was 300,000 houses a year under the Duke of Edinburgh's programme. <coughs> so I can't stand how many times it's just... Stop it. Just stop it. Over, you know, it's a sun on the meadows, sunlit uplands kind of promise, and it's just sickening to people who've heard it all their life, which is my age <coughs> and below. There is housing. It is an emergency. There are people with too much. You want to sort things out longer in the term, but there's low-hanging fruit uh, to be had, and it's possible if you care. When those, was it a million Ukrainians walked into Poland? They were all housed in bedrooms in Poland. Right? You can do things if you really care, if you think there's an emergency. Uh, and, that, that's, and it's just telling people that. The danger of not doing it, the danger of moving so far towards the person living in the third best off areas of Selby with the large bungalow as your target voter, is that somebody young in Uxbury just ain't going to bother or will go green. And you'll think, oh, that's to do with a low traffic zone. No, it isn't. It's that you can't be bothered to get out of bed if you're under 40 and there's a party not offering. Um, but even worse, you get into power... And then somebody in 20 years sits there going, what exactly did you do when you were in it? Right? That's, that's a serious worry. And I'm just telling you it, it how it is. I come from a city with an incredibly divided Labour Party, of course, now. Um, well, the first time Labour have lost control of Oxford without an election. But a lot of our cities feel like this, and a lot of our university towns uh, feel like it. And it's easy to be celebratory in the Labour Party because you see a poll to ask people what they'll do. But it's very different in, in places like Oxford where you've got lots of people on very low-paid job. You may have a wrong idea of Oxford. Oxford has exactly the same <laughs> national proportion of every decile group by poverty as the country as a whole. Like the city is actually remarkably uh, representative uh, of England, slightly more diverse than most of England. 
Yeah. Um, well, I think it's, I think it's a really interesting discussion. I think that's a it, it, very interesting question, um, and I, I kind of grapple with it, you know, because um, I mean, let's face it, labour is fearful. We, 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 we don't have an, uh, a belief that we are, we have a right to rule. We're, we're, we're born to rule. We're we're, we're a bit scared, um, and you know that kind of the fear factor is tempered. You know, I lived through eighty three. I was immensely excited by the eighty three manifesto, the longest suicide note in history. Um, uh, so you know, when you live through the kind of uh, uh, trauma of, of the nineteen eighties, eighty three, eighty seven. 921 uh, defeats and so on. Um, you're a bit scared, I guess. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I know, and I think that, you know, what Danny, Danny's prescriptions are great, but I imagine that Keir Starmer would, be, get, would get very, very nervous about the effect on the potential uh, voters switching from the Conservative Party to Labour because you know what the Telegraph will do with that. I'm not, this is not mm. an argument against what you're saying. But I think this is the kind of conditioning that we we all, most of us, um, suffer from. Um, that said, uh, I, d- I absolutely agree, and I absolutely believe, sincerely believe, that Labour has to be positive about uh, a radical housing programme, and that includes certainly reforms to the private rental sector. You know, security of tenure, some form of rent control. However, you know. Sophisticatedly, that is that is implemented. So, so definitely, you know, private rental sector. And of course, that's really important for young voters, uh, in particular. Although increasingly, also middle-aged voters and so on. Um, and Labour actually really needs to talk up social housing. And this is my little kind of bugbear with with Keir, because uh, you know, because uh, I absolutely, again, I completely understand. You you you, you, you talk about own occupation. You, I'm not sure you could call it a gold standard, but you can kind of can pretend it is. But you should also be aware that equally, that you know, secure, decent, affordable, genuinely affordable social rented housing is a gold standard for many people. Uh, and it should be seen as an equal partner, at least. And it is an equal partner. It's a vital part of any viable housing market. So if we shouldn't kind of relegate social housing, even rhetorically, to something which is inferior. Um, and I think we're, yeah, I think we're able to. I think we're in a position where we can do that now. I mean, you know, we, we've talked obviously in a very positive case about social council housing. Um, it's no good denying that, that by the by, nineteen seventy nine, you know, Thatcher didn't come out of nowhere. There was disenchantment, right to buy. Of course, was an incredibly popular policy, and so on. So, um, so if we had, you know, this is this is my incredibly kind of simplistic historical take on things, which I probably shouldn't. Uh, articulate, but you know, basically, we had a kind of forty-year cycle of social democracy, the post-war consensus, uh, which took us into the nineteen seventies, towards the end of the nineteen seventies. Famously, it was Anthony Crossland that said in nineteen seventy-six, the party's over, and that's when things started shifting. Uh, and obviously, Thatcher <coughs> rode that horse to to its full effect uh, into the eighties and beyond. So we had a forty-year sort of post-war consensus. We had a forty years, again, to put it crudely, of neoliberalism. Uh, and we know, and we know from Grenfell, uh, you know, it's dissected this so forensically that deregulation, lack of oversight, uh, cost cutting, uh, cost lives. Um, we know that we need the state uh, to, to regulate, to supervise, to oversee, um, and to provide. And I think people, you know, I think we're in, we're in a, a mindset uh, my, it, it, where, where people actually appreciate that. They, you know, from mm. To use the jargon, their own lived experience. Uh, Thatcher was an idealist. You know, she, she thought the market actually could solve things. She, really, she believed it, and I give her credit for that. Uh, what we know, uh, we know from the kind of awful situation we're, we're in currently, the housing crisis we, we're experiencing, is that the market won't do that. And I think, I think also the general population understand that. So, so rhetorically, uh, ideologically, politically. Uh, in terms of our presentation of presentation of policies, in terms of some, some braver policies, absolutely, Labour should be making the positive case um, there. Uh, possibly, sorry, just very quickly. I mean, right to buy. I think we could abolish right to buy. We should abolish right to buy. We should all we'll change the resident limits, residential uh, timelines, so so severely that it becomes kind of meaningless. So that's something positive we can do, and I think people are ready to hear that as well. Thank you very much.
Um, I've got two final questions from some people online. I've um, got Sarah Young and Barb, Barb Roberts. Sarah, do you want to go first and then Barb goes straight after and we'll take the two together. Hi, sorry to welcome you to my kitchen. Um, uh, I put my question in the chat, which was, how do you both see the role of um, housing associations in developing social housing going forward? Sort okay. of ID. Thank you. And then Bob? Uh, yeah, I'm Bob Roberts. Um, I'm a council tenant in Hackney. Um, um, and my question is, is mainly for John. I really enjoyed um, your presentation on the history of um, council housing. Big me you didn't include my block. <laughs> it was built in 1904, completed in 1905. And I proudly, along with another happy friends who's on this call, took part in the council's celebration, 100 years celebration of the Anne Addison Act in 2018. And I, I, I've traced, found out an awful lot about my block, you know, being the Edwardian solid mansion style red brick building. So my question is really, do you think there's no pride in the architecture of building council homes anymore, um, that, uh, you know, they're just functionary boxes built and, and well established our architects don't really see any future work in the councils because there's no big money to be made from them. You know, I mean, I follow all the big housing programs and one of my fav favorites is um, architecture's Lutchens and his um, Page Street development in Westminster may not to be everyone's taste, the checkerboard, but it stood the test of time. I mean, you know, in the 90s in Hackney, obviously they needed to be built housing very quickly post-war, but we had, you know, they were demolishing tower blocks because they'd gone up so quickly, no real design, built of the wrong materials, and they were having to be demolished. So they, to me, there just seems no quality to the modern builds. And they, you know, they used to be proud to say, I'm a council tenant. We need to bring the right back to these buildings. Fantastically high ceilings, decent living room spaces like mine. You know, it's just, doesn't seem any pride. You're lucky if you get a little Juliet balcony railing on the court, if you live on the corner of um, a block, you know, uh, yeah, uh, architects, thanks. Thank you very much, Bob. Last two questions for today. Um, so, which of you would like to go, fight to go first? Uh, should I go first? Yeah. Sure. Okay. I quite like the, I didn't know about the 80%, uh, 80 to 20 ratio that local councils were allowed to permit of, of building in the past. Um, I think that, that last vision is where we should be aiming at, but that is probably realistically 10, 15, 20, 25 years away. The whole of Europe's <coughs> getting poorer, we're getting poorer faster than the, uh, the rest of it. Ways to stop getting poorer? Housing associations. Some of them are essentially large-scale voluntary transfers. They are council housing, except no democratic control and a higher salary. And slightly dodgy finance model, actually. Uh, one top five. One will show me there are two spreadsheets. <laughs> so, anyway, um, there are a huge number of housing associations. They're very, very inefficient because of number. Some of the chief executives are paid an enormous amount. They're essentially private businesses not controlled by business law. There is a, an English way of dealing with this and maybe a better way. The English way of dealing with it is you get Office of National Statistics to declare housing association sector as part of the state. Just in the national stats may sound ridiculous, it's what we did to further education colleges last year. They were all nationalised by ONS. The Secretary of State wrote them all a letter telling them you don't borrow any money anymore and you're part of my department. Uh, not in the news at all, just look up further education colleges nationalised. Because you get too poor as a country, you can't afford to carry on this silly dust any, anymore. Um, I would rather than use ONS and do it by subterfuge of housing associations 
actually come out and say, this has to end. We can't have as many. <coughs> None of you can be paid more than the Prime Minister. Um, and you can be held individually liable for the black mould and get out and just transfer it to a proper democratically accountable uh, housing authority, unless you're really, really good. Um, but that, that experiment in creating this do-gooder, do-gooder charity kind of almshouse model for the masses um, has largely failed. Small niche ones, fine. But, but the big ones, less so. Um, and, and it's a real inefficiency. Because all the cost of all those salaries is part of our problem in Britain. The same with the housing, the homelessness charities. You wouldn't believe, if you go through the books and the accounts of the homelessness charities, just how expensive this is. We have an industry in housing people badly in this country. We have an industry in people being homeless. We have... A, <coughs> yeah. Uh, and although the majority of private landlords have only got one or two, you're right, and they do it not well because you don't know how to do it, um, the majority of houses being rented privately are... They know how to make money, landlords, but you make money by not doing it up. Um, and, and this is why I just say, get out there and say it. Don't worry you're going to lose... Only 3% of people are landlords, right? And believe me... Almost none of them vote Labour, and they're not going to, <laughs> right? <coughs> so just get out and, and say what the dream, the aspiration is, which is housing for all, better quality, lower price. And simply by saying it, you affect how people behave, whether large pension companies think they can get a really high rate of return by investing in a mimicry of social housing, but where they have to cream off that profit for the pensioners of Canada, right? You stop them thinking of coming to this country to do it uh, by saying that's your aspiration. Just tinkering uh, isn't how we achieved what we achieved in the past, and it's not how any of those European countries that do so much better than us achieve what they have. And we have rising infant mortality, children getting shorter, you know, it, it, it is that bad that it is so serious there isn't an excuse. That's my last word. Uh, well, I, I won't comment on housing associations. I think you've dealt, you've done, you've done, you've done that. Um, uh, hi, Barbara, if you're still there. Um, I'm guessing you, you would, you'd live either in Darcy House or Villette House, one of those? Yeah, uh, yes. Villette, OK, great. Um, yeah, well, I know, sorry I didn't mention it. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm really glad you raised the point that you did, and I'm really, it's lovely to hear that, that pride, because I think a lot of people feel that pride in, in their council home. I always make a point of calling them homes, not dwellings or units or whatever, because that's essentially what they've been uh, for many millions of our people over, over, over the last century or so. Um, and we can take pride in, uh, in, in council housing, not just in numbers, but in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. We looked at the Homes for Heroes of the Addison era, 1919. Um, let's not forget Parker Morris in 1961 uh, and Parker Morris standards, which was, you know, potential heating, increased space, the flexible use, uh, sort of family use of, 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 of the new homes and flats. Um, you know, they were applied to public housing uh, to the new towns, first of all, in 1967, I think, and to all new council <coughs> housing in 1969. They weren't applied to private speculative building, but Anthony Greenwood, who was the housing minister, hoped that private developers would, would, take the, take the, you know, would emulate the quality and standards of local authority building. Um, and, of course, what we know since then, uh, obviously Thatcher abolished the Parker Morris standards anyway, uh, but local authorities have tried to maintain them, the Lo London standards emulate them currently. Um, so, of course, council housing remains an example. Um, and if you're looking at the lower end of the market, if you're looking at you know, lower-income groups, uh, absolutely, you know, if, you're, if you're looking to quality housing, you're looking to uh, local authority-constructed homes. Um, that's not to say, of course, <laughs> mistakes weren't made and things uh, need to be improved and refurbished and so on, as Pete reminded us. Um, so, you know, we're not, not sort of, sort of poly, polyanna-ish about this, but let's take some pride and uh, 
let's remember just what, what we have achieved. Uh, and that's finally, just really my final point, um, is let's remember uh, what we are currently achieving, despite the low, low numbers. I, I, I think in terms of local authority housing, the standards are still good. Um, you know, if you look at what Camden's doing, a lot, a lot of the London boroughs, they're building to high quality. Um, and increasingly, of course, I mean, it's funny, it's, it's odd in the sense that we haven't come up with this afternoon, um, but sustainability, uh, building to uh, very strong and uh, powerful inf- uh, environmental standards is absolutely the way that we have to go to meet the current climate emergency. And, of course, local authorities are in the vanguard of, of that. And, again, setting an example to what... Uh, you know, speculative builders and speculative profit doesn't really aspire to. Um, and of course, let's just remember Goldsmith Street, North City Council, 100%, 100% social rent housing, uh, 100% passive house, uh, a real quality development, winner of the uh, Sterling Prize in 2019 as the best architectural building scheme of that era. Uh, and that kind of standard is being emulated on a small scale but uh, local authorities are uh, are ambitious to build well and I know for a fact they're ambitious to build more so let's hope both that ambition and that uh, that can can be that ambition can be unleashed by a Labour government which will actually empower local authorities and finance local authorities to do the best that we can and uh, certainly what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you both.